welcome to Doctrine and Devotion, a podcast that explores Christian faith and practice from a Reformed Baptist perspective. My name is Joe Thorne. I'm the lead pastor of Redeemer Fellowship in St. Charles, Illinois. And excuse our mess. Uh, I'm in the church building and we're having a lot of work done. Uh, painting, new flooring for the sanctuary. We've been out of our sanctuary for almost two years. It started with COVID and we were looking for different places and uh, we're moving back in on November 6th. And so we've had a ton of crews out here, volunteers, contractors uh, to really get this place looking good, make it a suitable place for corporate worship once again. So if you hear any uh, banging, yelling, screaming, sawing or whatever, uh, that's what that is. Uh, I promise it's not not a torture house or anything. Uh, We are super, super Super excited to have Dr. Matthew Barrett back on the podcast with us. If you don't know, uh, Dr. Barrett is uh, a associate professor of Christian theology at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's the author of books. You might have heard of some of them, like Simply Trinity. Fantastic book, important book that everybody should get. And um, you know what? You uh, you started Credo Magazine. You're an uh, editor there, and you host the Credo uh, podcast. Is that right? That's right. And actually, uh, I mean, the Credo podcast has been so fun. Uh, I mean, who gets to just sit down and talk theologian to theologian? And uh, so that's been fun. And uh, recently, too, I, I, I have to mention this. We've started the Center for Classical Theology. is Ooh. is a bit of a academic arm of Credo. And uh, Crossway Publishing is uh, partner partnering with us to, to publish a... Um, we're going to have an annual lecture and they're going to publish it as a book. So awesome. uh, each year. So I'm very, I'm, I could not be more excited about that. Awesome. I heard the Vatican signed off on this as well, because obviously <laughs> this is the road to Rome. You're obviously going Catholic, full Catholic. Um, Joe, I can always count on you to, uh, yeah. I, <laughs> I have to say dumb things because other people say silly things uh, and I just thought I'd jump on the bandwagon. Uh, no, I, I'm so grateful for the theology that you teach. It is richly biblical. And uh, what, what I like is that you, you aim at the experiential as well. Um, you know, God is meant to be known, right? Not just known about. And so uh, I, I love it. And uh, I continue, listen, I'm 50 and uh, I'm still learning. I'm still learning as a theologian. I'm still growing as a theologian. And uh, I've been so grateful for uh, the retrieval and the emphasis on classical theism. It's been, it's been a, a, a great help to me personally. So uh, a great. Well, that's so encouraging. And everything. Yeah, no, that, that is so encouraging, Joe, to hear that. And that's, that's true of us all. Um, you know, I, one of the things that I love about theology is, and I, I tell my students this, don't think you graduate and it's over and you've mastered it all. Right. Um, it's, it's a bit like sanctification. Mm. God is constantly refining our knowledge of him uh, in Christ. Yeah, that's good. That's good. How are things at the seminary? You know, things are great. Uh, things have never been better at the seminary. We just uh, celebrated actually uh, 10 years since uh, Jason Allen became president, and you know you're familiar with the whole for the church yep. um, um, ministry there, and uh, it's been ten, it's been a decade, which is hard to believe. Yeah, uh, but it's gone by so fast. Um, I've loved being part of it. I've been part of it now. I'm this is going on my sixth year uh, at, at Midwestern, and I'm just so thankful to God uh, that He brought me there, and uh, I'm just. In one sense, I, yeah, I'm teaching systematic theology, um, historical theology, philosophy, etc. But in one sense, I'm just sitting back and just watching, um, loving seeing you know student after student learn and uh, go into ministry or go into teach schools, uh, become prof- professors themselves. So for me, it's a it's a that's very rewarding mm-hmm. uh, in, in countless ways. Well, one of the things that I, I... I te- we all tend to take note of are the students that are coming out of seminaries, you know, because seminaries, listen, different kinds of people come out of various seminaries, but you know, when I, the, the, the Dallas seminary grads that I've met, they, they are a certain way and, and it's a compliment. I'm, I'm not, I'm not picking on them at all. Um, I've met some very sharp people coming out of, out of, out of Dallas, but each seminary kind of has its own vibe, its own culture, and it tends to produce yeah. people with certain emphases and uh, some not so great, you know, uh, and some really wonderful. <laughs> and the people that I've met who have come out of the MDiv program, people that I've met who've got their PhDs there, uh, wonderful people who really love the Lord, love the church, and uh, love the truth. They're approachable, humble, 
godly earnest. Um, that's always a, something that I look at, and I'm, I'm very encouraged by what's coming out of Midwestern. L- love what's going on there. Well, Joe, we might just have to bring you back and uh, say, hey, let's get let's get Joe in the classroom here. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I don't think I'm seminary uh, material. I don't I don't think uh, I don't think they, they, they usually use me for stuff. But um, but I, I definitely want to come in and visit. And, and I haven't I still haven't seen the Spurgeon Center. So I need to do that. Um, oh, okay. But so listen, we wanted to bring you on to talk about systematic mm-hmm. theology, uh, something that you're obviously passionate about, very invested in, something that you teach. Um, I love systematic theology, and when I became a Christian, I, uh, I mean, I didn't. When I became a Christian, I didn't know the Bible at all. I didn't go to church growing up ever. So I was converted. I'd been to church three times. I just started reading the Bible, and then I began reading it over and over again. And uh, so I started picking up a book here and there. I got a John MacArthur book, and it was actually really helpful for me. And uh, the first systematic theology that I grabbed happened to be Charles Hodge, three volumes from a Christian okay. bookstore. They actually had Hodge in a Christian <laughs> bookstore. It was crazy. This would have been 91. And uh, it's the green three volume. You know, I think it's Baker. I can't remember who the publisher yeah. was. And uh, I started reading that thing, and it unlocked so much for me that uh, and really turned me on to systematic theology so i've yeah. i've loved it ever since because i needed i needed some way of getting my head and heart around the bible with no background or training right so i needed something yeah. to help me figure begin to figure things out and and connect those dots so i love systematic theology and i know you do as well in fact i mean you you're working on a systematic theology right I am not a secret. Or not. Yeah, um, you know, it's one of those things that, as a theologian, you think uh, I'd love to do that one day. But it's it's a scary thought because, yeah. like you said, I mean, it's it's the one of the biggest undertakings to to try to put everything together. Um, and Baker Academic came; uh, they approached me and said. Hey, we really want you to write this a systematic theology. Uh, I mean, I'm sure uh, listeners out there are aware of uh, Millard Erickson's systematic theology, which has been going for a very long time and uh, has sold really well. Uh, like you said, you know, every systematic, you know, you mentioned how every school and graduates are different. That's very true of every systematic theology right. as well, both in terms of the feel of it, the style, of the content, of course, the theology itself. And so uh, I'm really excited to, to – I've already started my research and writing. I, it will take me uh, some time. It's not just one of those books you write uh, in a year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it will take some time. Uh, but, but I don't want to take too long because I do think it's timely in a sense. I think that there are Christians, pastors – professors out there that are are looking um they've tried out systematic theologies in the past couple decades and they're still looking for something uh and that's where i want to i want to step into that very humbly and say um here's here's how i want to teach my master of divinity students so it will be a systematic theology that is for uh master students and then, Lord willing, the plan is to write uh, a, a, probably a smaller one that will be for college students. Uh, and, and that one will be especially accessible mm. given the average college student. And then, um, you know, long term, the idea is uh, I, I've got a Doctrine of God contracted with Baker Academic as well. That'll probably be at a higher level, more like scratch the itch of of the phd student right right so uh i'm i'm thrilled about it and uh, honestly one of the ways i'm approaching it is as a team and so there are a lot of uh theologians i greatly respect out there and i'm asking them to come along with me uh in this writing pilgrimage and uh They've been so uh, gracious with their time to say, yeah, I'll, I'll read that part. I'll read that section. I'll read that chapter and give you some critical feedback. That's great. So I'm hoping that by the time I finish it, uh, 
yes, you know, I'm my my name goes on the cover, I suppose, but ultimately it's the fruit of much feedback and collaboration mm -hmm. with other theologians that I'm sure both of us um, really respect and love. You know how hard it is for me to not drop the worst names that uh, that would be partnering <laughs> with you. I, I'm, I'm, I haven't done that. I'm not going to do it. You're a professor at a seminary. I don't want to make you make it awkward for a boy. If it was anybody else, I'd be like, oh, so like this guy and this guy. And it would be really obviously not the people that you would want working with you. I'm not going to do that. Listen, um, I want to talk about Sistheo, what it is, what separates it yeah. from other forms of, or approaches to theology and, you know, uh, why it seemed to sort of a lot of seminaries were pushing back against it. Like as I know in the nineties and, and they, they started to push back against this in academic circles. A lot of seminaries were dropping systematic theology. Um, yeah. And so I want to talk about some of that, but you know, we we're, we're getting a, a Baptist here writing a systematic theology and that's <laughs> really good because we don't have much what we got. A H strong. Um, uh, we have Erickson, uh, I guess Grudem, uh, so why are those not, how do I say this? I'm trying to be charitable here. <laughs> Where do those volumes not measure up to yeah. what you would like to see in a, in a systematic theology from a, a credo Baptist perspective? Yeah. Oh, uh, goodness. Where do we start? <clears throat> I think the first thing I want to say, Joe, is that when we look at how systematic theology has been done over the last 40 years, not everywhere, but I'm talking about in that vein that you just mentioned, right? Uh, it's, it's a very uh, different approach to systematics than I think from what you find in the history of the church. Now, that may sound surprising. I mean, we're talking about some systematic theologies. You think of Grudem's, for example, that have been bestsellers and have uh, been on the bookshelves of Christians everywhere. And some of it is the actual theology, right? And, and I think that needs to be clear. Um, I think when, when someone like Wayne Grudem is proposing uh, a view of the Trinity uh, that's called EFS that uh, argues for the functional subordination of the Son within the imminent life of, of the Godhead. I think we have to be very clear here that this is a departure yeah. from historic uh, Nicene Trinitarian theology and with it systematic theology. Um, so there's content issues uh, right. that have to be, I think, corrected and addressed. And uh, that's where I think many theologians, many great theologians today are stepping into that gap and trying to supplement and correct and uh, reform so that students of systematic theology see, uh, see things for what they are and realize, oh, this is actually, this feels more modern than it does historical and orthodox. So that's the first thing I would say is there is a content issue, but... I think if we stop there, we're not actually addressing the real problem because in, th in systematic theology, and this is how systematic theology works, you don't arrive at certain conclusions by accident. Mm. Oftentimes your method leads you in one direction and not the other. And so that has to be addressed as well. I think just to throw a, a label out there, though sometimes people mean different things by it, I think there has been a steady stream of biblicism, uh, and I use that in the negative sense of the word, that has uh, dictated how systematic theology is written, how it's taught, and, and even what conclusions we reach. Now, we, I'm sure that's a whole other conversation, but uh, at the very least, there's certain ingredients. And these are. this is one of the things I'm going to do in my systematic is I'm not going to address biblicism, uh, lay out certain maybe four or five things that, that define it and explain why that actually uh, undermines systematic theology itself. But just to, to point out one of them, I think in the contemporary scene, there has been uh, an over-focus on what occurs in the economy, in history, to the extent that we don't actually have a robust category anymore for God in and of himself. Oh. Um, 
and behind this is uh, metaphysics, um, which is extremely important. I know that metaphysics has to do a lot with philosophy, but we all come to the biblical text with a certain metaphysic in the back of our mind that we're operating from, and uh, every systematic the theologian does as well. So part of what that means, I mean, maybe listeners have picked up on this a little bit, is they're saying, why are all these books coming out on the Trinity or God's simplicity or God's aseity and so on, immutability. And so it's because we're feeling that. Yeah. Um, there was a very strong push in the 20th century um, by, by some of the, the most um, aggressive modern theologians to historicize God, that, that would be me saying that in a critical sense in response to them, to historicize God. And so I think now evangelicals are realizing, well, has that, has that influ influenced us to any extent, even if you know we're not that extreme? And I think the answer has been, yeah, to one extent or another. Um, so that raises the question, well, how then should we be approaching the biblical text? Uh, should we actually be paying attention to clues in the text itself that seem to assume a certain understanding of God of himself in order to make sense of something like, say, the gospel of Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. So moving away from an, uh, from a, a type of crude biblicism, uh, that's just one example, but, but that speaks volumes as to, yeah, we need a different type of method that will actually lead us to, to more orthodox conclusions in mm. the end. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. I mean, I, when I, so I, I read, I started to read Hodge, um, as a young Christian, very young Christian, about a year old in the faith. Um, and then I read Burkhoff and I devoured Burkhoff. It's one volume. So, uh, but I just, I loved it. It was so helpful. And then I began picking up other things. Um, and, when Grudem's systematic theology came out, uh, the thing that was really standing out to me, besides some of the some of the theological weirdness that I had issues with, and 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 some of that is just there are perspectives, right? I mean, I read Erickson; yeah. it's a well laid out systematic theology. I don't like his conclusions. <laughs> I mean, he tends to take like, well, there's a Reformed view and the Arminian view, and I'm in the middle, whatever. Yeah. But um, when I was reading modifications, right? This yeah. is another issue. Uh, a constant. There's a constant tendency among evangelicals. There's there's almost this irresistible allure mm -hmm. <laughs> to modify just about everything. Yeah, and I think I think we've we're, we've seen by 2022 where that is it, it tends to lead, and yeah. that I think is another weakness is this allure to to modification or in the more stronger sense of the word a revisionism. Mm -hmm. And Which I, brings us into a whole nother category, but and I get it. Yeah. Like you know, some people it's really they're you know they're they're studying it's their conscience, but there's also this ugly sort of like, um, like I remember in in some academic circles, like oh that's the traditional view. It's just like so, it's just boring. Right. It's just, that's, that's just <laughs> why would you care about the traditional? View? And then there's the publishers who want something different. You know, they want something to sell. Like, well, what, why do we need another? You're going to say the same thing somebody else said. But what stood out <laughs> to me at the time when I was reading Grudem was I, I kept thinking like, the, and I, at first I couldn't, I didn't know why, but I'm like, there, he doesn't have philosophy. He doesn't have history. Like all the systematic theologies that I've read so far, philosophy, history, like everything is a, yeah. is a part of it. And he's just got his arguments and Bible verses. And that doesn't make it wrong. I mean, uh, right. J.L. Dagg's, you know, manual of theology is just like an exegetical theology. It's just, you know, it's, it's not a systematic theology. But is that, am, am I wrong? Hmm. See, I'm, I don't want to, I don't want to make a, a full on argument about it, but is, is that per perhaps, uh, a reflection of a kind of biblicism where there's just no philosophy or history involved in the presentation of systematic theology. Joe, you've, you've hit the nail on, on the head. Hey! <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, it's not the only thing, but it, it, this is, I would say one of the main pillars, right? And so when you read that type of systematic theology and there's no historical awareness, it's not surprising then that there's little, hesitancy to start departing from a historical, maybe even an orthodox understanding of God and Christ. Like eternal generation of the sun. 
like eternal generation what and in I the think, world and i think we i mean there's even areas that we haven't even explored yet um i would say in christology as well uh why is it that evangelicals seem to flirt with a type of modified or soft uh canonic christology uh well when we have no historical engagement in our systematic theology like you said it doesn't necessarily mean we we will err but it sure puts us at risk yeah and this is where i think cs lewis for example is so wise because lewis i mean many of, of the your listeners are, are maybe familiar with athanasius's little book on the incarnation but lewis wrote a small preface to it and he says in that preface it's not that those in the past didn't make mistakes they did but uh and it's not that they didn't have blind spots they certainly did and we see some of those today right so i don't want to give the impression that when we talk about retrieval that this is just a mere repristination like i don't know anyone who actually believes that uh lewis is right they do have blind spots but lewis when he finishes his sentence he says but they were t- typically not our blind spots mm. And that's where, in order to do systematic theology, I think, in the right way, we always have to humble ourselves and stand on the shoulders of those who've come before us. And actually, I think, uh, here's the irony of it, that's actually quite biblical as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when we, when we sit down or when we teach, when we sit down to write or when we teach systematic theology, um, The Bible, of course, is our final authority because it alone is our written inspiration for articles of faith, for example. Um, But uh, contrary to some modern uh, assumptions, we we don't shut ourselves in a room, push out what came before us or, or even what's around us as if we read the Bible by ourselves. Yeah. Um, the irony of that of that type of biblicist assumption is that, um, and they would hate hearing this, but that's actually far more modern uh, than it is ancient or even apostolic. Right. And so this is where even when I'm teaching my students, you know, just the other day, uh, we were looking at uh, the doctrine of the Trinity. <laughs> And we were looking at uh, the inseparable operations. And we looked at a passage like Ephesians 1. And we had a a very fruitful discussion. But as we're doing that and we're opening our Bible with Paul, we are also reading our Bible with the church. And so, you know, at Midwestern Seminary, some may have heard that, you know, slogan, we're for the church. Well, if we believe that, if we take that seriously, that means we read the Bible with the church as well. And that... That is to our advantage. Uh, I don't. If if I sit down and read the Bible by myself, um, the chances I'm going to <laughs> to uh, err are, are pretty high. But when I'm sitting down and reading the Bible, and I can look over my shoulder and say, "Hey, I think Augustine actually thought about this Psalm for like ten years." I'm going. I want. I want his insight, yeah. uh, even if I disagree with him. At the end of the day, I want to know what he said so that I can be more faithful mm. to the Scripture. The scriptural text as well and so in class we you know uh we're inviting you know gregory of nazianzas to, to ask okay what do you see in john 5 when jesus is making this statement it seems to say something about uh his eternal relation of origin and what what are you seeing in the exegesis here i think that um has been missing from systematics not entirely of course but in some of the examples you've mentioned and I'll just throw one thing out there, Joe, because obviously there's so much here we could talk about. But um, in that spirit of retrieval, um, we don't need to be embarrassed either that uh, we are going to be historically attuned, but also philosophically attuned as well. Yeah. And again, th- this is extremely ironic, isn't it? Because... Uh, sometimes the biblicist thinks, uh, well, that we can't have that. We have to put off. We have to put that off. Uh, we don't want that influencing um, our systematic or even how we're reading the biblical text. But of course, that's not even how the apostles operated. Um, 
I mean, the, the opening of John's gospel, uh, John is using a Greek concept, but of course he's uh, refining it in right. order to uh, take advantage of it for the sake of his Christology. Paul will do something similar in Acts 17. He's going to quote the Greeks to then put forward um, a, a more refined understanding and even Christian understanding of participation. In him we live and move and have our being. So all that means uh, it's quite over, overwhelming, right? Uh, the task of, of the systematic theologian is very complicated, but it's supposed to be, and uh, it's supposed to work to our advantage. Mm. Yeah, I was I was thinking that when you have whether whatever their intention is, when they present something like a systematic theology, and there is no philosophy or history. Um, what that does is it it feeds a generation of people who think you don't need philosophy or history to do theology. I mean, so regardless of what their intention is, your the byproduct is going to be damage to the church. So I wanted to ask you, uh, like, what is systematic theology? We've got <laughs> yeah. biblical theology, and we got systematic theology. Uh, what what is systematic theology? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a very difficult question. Uh, to answer, it, I, I always say, um, you know it when you see it, and you can sense uh, when it doesn't quite feel right. Um, you know, you've given the example of biblical theology. Uh, I love biblical theology. I've even written some books on biblical theology myself, and it's uh, it's contrary to what some people may say out there. Biblical theology and systematic theology are not at odds with where right. they shouldn't right. be at odds with one another. They're actually meant to complement each other and in crucial ways. Um, I, I think I would say this. Um, in systematic theology, we're not simply trying to understand, say, uh, for example, uh, the storyline of Scripture across uh, history. And so, so this would be a, an example, right? Because let's just take uh, redemption. I think we... We owe a huge debt to the biblical theologian who's able to carefully and very beautifully parse out how redemption uh, uh, crescendos uh, from, let's say, for example, this would be one type of biblical theology, but from, say, the beginning of the canon through to its culmination uh, in the New Testament. Uh, amen to that. But systematic theology... Um, of course, uh, is taking notes and paying attention and, and even uh, using that to its advantage in every way. But uh, with, say, the example of redemption, systematic theology is going to do more than that. Uh, systematic theology wants to ask even sometimes different questions. Uh, so yes, we see how redemption is unfolding in history. But why is it that we can call this redemptive history? Uh, well, that that assumes, um, goodness, it assumes a lot, doesn't it? It assumes certain systematic categories are in place. It assumes that uh, there is a God who is the divine author. There's not merely a human author. And it assumes that this God is, is uh, not just the first cause, but this God is providentially at work uh, to govern, to sustain, to work concurrently through human beings to ensure that history... Uh, actually has a certain final causality to it, uh, uh, an ultimate purpose, that it is progressing to a certain end. And of course, uh, that we see that in redemption through Jesus Christ mm -hmm. himself. But then it raises all kinds of questions even at that point. Well, in order for it to be a redemptive history, who must this God be? And so this is where you have wonderful examples of systematic theologians like Athanasius, uh, for example, who can say, unless this is the Son who's begotten from the Father from all eternity, he's not qualified to redeem us. Mm. So notice uh, Athanasius, he wants to affirm that very concrete biblical affirmation of redemption through Christ alone. But in order to do that, um, Athanasius has to, uh, has to operate with a theological mindset that actually reflects and even contemplates God in and of himself. Who must this God be as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit uh, to, for us to even talk about redemption in the first place? Mm. Um, John Webster, 
uh, was was quite um, helpful, I think, on this point. You know, in his day, he uh, saw in many universities how theology uh, in, in many ways was sidelined or it always had to be supplemented. Theology and uh, politics, theology and ethics, uh, it, the list just goes on. And John Webster made a great contribution, and, and I think we're all indebted to him because he said, whatever happened to theology as theology? <laughs> uh, in other words, even the word itself gets at, who is God? Shouldn't that be first and foremost what we are addressing? And then all things in relation to God. And I think he was right to say then, if we, if we understand who God is, that's the very core of what theology is about then things start to fall into place when we talk about, well, what is happening in history with redemption? Or what is the church? Or is there, a, is there an ultimate destination, an, an eschaton? And what does that involve? Um, without theology, though, none of that is possible in the end. Right. So it sounds like it, this is probably an oversimplification. And please tell me it is or that it's totally stupid. I'm, I'm, I'm fine to, to hear that. <laughs> but it sounds like that what you've said, at least in part, is that when we're looking at what's called biblical theology, and there are two kinds of biblical theology in, in my experience, there's, there's an, an, sure. in the academic world, they mean something a little bit different when they talk about biblical theology versus the biblical theology that most of us are familiar with. But it sounds like what you're saying, it sounds to me like what you were saying in, in some ways was biblical theology is dealing with the, 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 the themes and the stories that run throughout scripture, uh, you know, really culminating in, in Christ. And that systematic theology is dealing with doctrines and details um, more so uh, in a in a categorical way. Is 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 that fair to say? Or no? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I I think Joe, what you're getting at there is is you're starting to peel back layers of the onion, right? Because and, and we see this even the Westminster Confession that we also see it in our Baptist tradition with. Um, the Second London Baptist Confession, when e even how they're, they're, the systematic theologian is trying to read scripture, they're trying to do so. You remember that phrase where it says, some things are explicitly set down in the scriptures. And other things are deduced by good and necessary consequence. Right. It's that latter phrase, not that the first part isn't relevant to systematics, it is. But it's that latter phrase that often helps people understand, oh, that is necessary. Mm. Because there are many questions that the Bible does not address. And that's okay. We don't have to panic. <laughs> we don't need to treat the Bible as if it's a manual for every detail and every po possible question. Um, but I think what the confession is after there is we have to have systematic theology in order to deduce the answers to those good and necessary consequences from the biblical text. Now, I think what I'm saying is when you look back at the great tradition, and, and one of my favorites is uh, Anselm, um, the, the medieval scholastic theologian, um, what do you see? I think the way that they are approaching theology is uh, out of a certain vein. Uh, and just to give an example of this, uh, David in the Psalms, here is David uh what does he what does he want more than anything what does he see as as the essence of his life now but also uh the culmination of of true fulfillment and happiness and in god and david says i i want one thing um this is my passion i want to gaze at the beauty of the lord forever and he goes on to elaborate to say i want to i want to dwell in his temple yeah. <clears throat> I think that's getting at the heart of it. So when we talk about, when we use phrases like, we want a theological theology, it, it's both beginning with that driving motive. I want, and, and maybe the, a word that would help us here is contemplation. Um, we want to contemplate, we want to gaze. Uh, Thomas Aquinas used the phrase, uh, and this is very Davidic in the way that David uses it in the Psalms. We want a simple undistracted gaze at the beauty of the mm -hmm. Lord. I think that has to be primary. And so that's why when I do systematic theology, I use that word contemplation 
right out of the gate to make it very clear this is what we are after. And it's not just now, but it's in the future as well. Because when we ask, well, uh, what is the, the ultimate purpose we are after with our systematic theology? It's not merely information. Right. <laughs> and that's where I think sometimes systematic theologies can give that impression. Oh, we just collect the data and then we just somehow arrive at certain conclusions. Uh, no, actually, um, as we are contemplating God now, we are doing so knowing that one day it will it will come to it, it, the fullness of, the, of its culmination in the beatific vision itself, which is why when you get to say 1 John 3, John can say, uh, we will see him and we will be like him. And if you keep reading the very next verse or two, he then says, okay, let's get to work now and be holy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so that sets things in motion, doesn't it? For That sets the agenda, I think, for systematic theology to say, uh, well, if contemplating God is, this pri- is so primary, then it not only defines the task of the theologian now, but it actually defines and, and uh, gives the church hope now for the future to realize that's actually what we will be doing for all eternity, yeah. and that is where we will find, um, as Anselm said, we will find uh, the greatest joy and satisfaction is in knowing knowing God Himself. Now, you know how we do systematic theology. Well, then that has to sp- be spelled out. I love what Turton says uh, here. He's um, he's he's very open. You know, there's times when he will criticize Thomas Aquinas, uh, but this is one of those points where he just is unembarrassed to to quote. Or paraphrase Thomas Aquinas, and he essentially says, um, "What is theology? Well, theology is taught by God. Uh, uh, theology is of God, um, and theology leads to God." Mm. Right. So there you have it. Those three steps, uh, well, in the broadest sense, define our existence as Christians. Mm. But I think those are actually. I think Turton is right. Those are actually appropriate for structuring what systematic theology is about mm. in, in the most ultimate sense. I have a, I have a sense it's going to wind up in your systematic theology. <laughs> well, uh, Tur- Turton uh, is, uh, is so full of wisdom when it comes to uh, systematic theology itself, but the idea of contemplation. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And um, that brings up other things that, um, we probably don't have time to talk about, but I wish we did. Cause <laughs> this is, this is, this is so good. I, I really actually would love to bring you back on to talk more about systematic theology. Cause yeah. I have a, I have a bunch of other questions, um, that I'd like to, to hear you. And I just want to hear you answer. And I'd love to hear you just uh, expand more on it. Uh, but maybe we could end with this. Sure. Um, somebody wants to read, they want to start in on systematic theology, uh, we don't have uh, we don't have a lot of Baptist choices. Um, so, what what would you give somebody? What you know, if like an average person in the church, right? And um, and I know even that's going to vary from congregation to congregation. So uh, maybe that's that's not entirely fair. But what is an entry level introduction to systematic theology or a kind of systematic theology that you would recommend to church members? Hmm, that's really hard. Um. The reason this is so hard is because so many contemporary systematic theologies, though there are many I love, um, they don't always connect uh, who God is or what we might call just classical theism to everything else, Mm -hmm. like creation out of nothing, divine providence, even ethics. And then part of the issue there is I think in contemporary systematic theologies, there's big gaps missing. When you look back at older systematic theologies, they're including entire chapters on things like ethics, for example. They're putting the pieces all together. Um, Or they begin by talking about hermeneutics and what is the fourfold method. You just don't see that today. Right. So all that, uh, that's a lead up to to say to people out there, um, I think my encouragement to you would be to go back uh, I would I would recommend say Herman Bavinck for example. There's an abridged version. If someone's just meeting 
uh, Bad Van Keer. There's an abridged version that uh, I think John Bolt has put together, and it's just called Reform Dogmatics. It's one volume. There's a more popular version, maybe for churchgoers, called the the uh, Wonderful or the Wondrous Works of God, uh, that may be more accessible still. So that's a, I think I, I love Bavank, and I think that he would be a very helpful, faithful guide. If you want to go back further still, I mean, for our Baptist friends out there who who really want to uh, you know nerd up on this, I would say I can't recommend enough uh, John Gill. Yeah. Um, uh, you you may struggle a little bit. I mean, he's obviously using a uh, different type of uh, vocabulary. But once you get into those waters with him, I think you will find him to be a very faithful guide. In terms of contemporary uh, books and contemporary systematic theologies, um, I, I, I have respected and appreciated, and I, I recommend um, Michael Horton. Um, he has written a fine systematic theology, the Christian faith. And then he's also written a smaller, more accessible um, book, uh, called Pilgrim Theology right. that um, I think you will find a, a very uh, accessible guide as well. So those are just a few. I could recommend so many more. I think if someone really wanted to dig in, um, I would recommend to them the Reformed Scholastics. And we're seeing some amazing uh, reprints and translations right now. Uh, Peter von Maastricht, for example, uh, his volumes on theology uh, those are starting to to come out, and it's exciting to see that. And then in a few years, Dr. Matthew Barrett's Systematic Theology. That's what we're Lord doing willing, right. Lord willing. Uh, pr- please pray for me. Please pray for me because um, I, I really, honestly, want it to uh, serve uh, serve God's people well and uh, honor God in the end. Well, listen, pray for uh, Dr. Barrett, and uh, go ahead and at him on Twitter. It's Matt. M. Barrett. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. At Matt M. Barrett. Go ahead. Tell him, uh, you know, tell him to kiss the Pope or whatever you got to tell him. Uh, <laughs> or more than like, really what you should be doing is thanking him and praying for him. And, but you know what? Yeah, he engages on Twitter. So uh, yeah, hit him up and uh, see what's going on there. Be sure to pick up uh, his books. Uh, the, the one that most people are familiar with is Simply Trinity. If you have not read that, pick it up it's very important we'll link to a bunch of this stuff in the show notes dr barrett thank you so much for coming on and we'll we'd love to have you back on again when your when your schedule allows and we'll talk more about systematic theology it's been great joe as always thank you for your ministry well for everybody else uh thanks for listening uh we appreciate you guys we uh you know we've got our podcast dropping every monday and thursday and if you want to support the podcast you can subscribe to all access that gives you theological meditations monday through friday and the banter of truth podcast where jimmy and i are just chopping it up and having a good time you can follow us online at doc and devo for twitter and instagram or you can hit the website doctrineanddevotion.com check us out there thanks a lot guys (laughs) 